Okay, so you don't want to be you don't want to be seen. It's time to leave. Okay. All right. Wow, we got a lot of people here tonight. So if, when we do our announcements here in a minute, you need to tell me why you came tonight. Was it the barbecue or you were just didn't, didn't want to cook tonight or whatever it was? This is great. Okay, so um, I call this meeting of the McKinney Chapter Sons of the American Revolution to order. Uh, let's see, uh, Don Babs. Yeah. Could you uh, give our invocation, please? Yes. Are you ready? Can everybody stand, please? Yes. <clears throat> Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you our humble praise for the gift of the United States of America, for the vision of our patriot ancestors, and for your continued preservation of this nation. I pray that you will guide and direct the leaders of our nation that we may have peace at home and show to the world your glory among the nations of the world. Father, give us a sense of all your mercies that we may declare your loving kindness from generation to generation. And Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that you will guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit and the work and activities of the sons of the American Revolution. And all of this we ask in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Uh, Pete, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, one God, liberty, and justice for all. Okay, boss, would you lead us from Texas, please? Sure, Texas. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. And Mark, would you do the links to the SDR? Yes, sir. We, the descendants of the heroes of the American Revolution, who by their sacrifices established the United States of America, reaffirm our faith in the principles of liberty and our constitutional republic, and solemnly pledge ourselves to the amendment and the spirit of God. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay. Self introduction. Pass the microphone around where people on Zoom can hear. Bill Taylor, Frisco, the wife's parents are going to see me in what I did we can. Really enjoyed it. So I said she didn't want to cook tonight. <laughs> that is true. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm Mark McCroft of the King, and uh, our speaker and I are speaking on the Bad Girls of the American Revolution. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to come tonight was to find out some good stories to tell my little girls about standing up for themselves. Good evening. I'm Pete McClellan, and I live in McKinney, and I came out to hear about the bad girls. Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, Andre Petty, I was just passing through and I'm Joe Chenoweth, I live in Allen, and uh, I came because it's a regular meeting night. Yeah, good reason. Uh, my name is Bill Cutting, and I'm not really sure why I came. I just like dressing up like this and driving around. <laughs> and I Tom asked me if I would be all speaker tonight. So, uh, so, and then tomorrow I'll be back to speak to Mark Harrison's group over at Highland Springs Retirement Center. So, Peter Gordon, I'm here because I love this group. Bless you, I'm King, Secretary. And online, we have uh, Al Easy and Don Babs. I'm Noeen McKinney, and I'm here to drop off books and attend the regular meeting because I like to meet them. So get updates on the color of each of in general. I'm John Greer. 27 years ago, 
two days ago, Nathan White inducted me into the Plano chapter. Then he joined, yeah, I joined, he said, you're a major, now our new chapter. That's the way Nathan always did it. I come to hear what Bill's got to say, see if he can teach me something about history. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's a great speaker. That's what he might do. I have a little watch in the Dallas chapter. What's your name? Tell me, of course, I'm the Dallas chapter. I'm the member of the county chapter. I'm district six. Mark Harrison, Dallas chapter, and I came here tonight to become a bill member with McKinney. Here's 20 bucks. <laughs> Jerry Barker, Evan Darrell, and Sherman, and uh, Jim Akers. Oh, here you go. Jim Chunky. Uh, <laughs> 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 Mandy Wilson, I live in Plano, and I came to see my uncle, Tom Wilson. <laughs> and uh, this uh, talk about Bill sounds really interesting. Hi, my name is Terry Ward. I'm from Frisco, and I Really enjoyed the presentation. They're always very good. And you really come back here. I just appreciate the like minded folks. Good evening. I'm Carl Flowers. I'm a guest. Uh, I speak out of the boundaries, but I'm a recent immigrant. Our family just here. No. Mm -hmm. to, to the United States. <laughs> We're just here for 10 years, you know, so we're not all of you guys. But I love this group, and so I appreciate you letting me come to this. At Uber and did Uber. I had a free coupon back and did it. He's working yeah, that's right. <laughs> anyway, um, buzz. I want to hear the bad girls. Is yeah. that everybody? Who has the time? Anybody? I treat the back. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you take that back there? And here's a couple more, I think. Okay. So I think we've got an exciting program tonight. I'm going to turn this over to Mark. He'll introduce our speaker and. Uh, Our speaker tonight is uh, known far and wide in the SAR circles. He's uh, spoken on a variety of wonderful topics. He's uh, taught history at, in Waxahachie, and his uh, topic tonight, uh, the bad girls of the revolution, should be a uh, very uh, interesting and very exciting. Um, he told me that he's spoken to many large groups, but in fact, he said one time on a, on a, I guess an off night, he spoke to a group of three people. So I'm thankful we have more than three people here tonight. <laughs> and, uh, and Bill told me that he's uh, given speeches to the SAR and to other groups about the revolution for over 20 years now. And uh, we're very thankful to hear him. And uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for having me come. I, I, I think it's kind of interesting. DAR groups ask for this presentation all the time. Um, as a matter of fact, they've actually asked me to expand on it, and uh, and and it, uh, uh, all of you gentlemen remember when we were kids going down to a creek or a pond. If you found the stones, you know, if you could find a good flat one, you'd pick it up and skip it across the water. That's the way I've likened tonight's presentation. I'm only touching the surface. Everything I'm going to tell you, there are many, many more examples. As a matter of fact, the greatest compliment given to American women at, at, during the American Revolution, the greatest contemporary compliment given to them was by the enemy. 
uh, Charles Lord Cornwallis, the commander in chief of the British forces in the South, wrote in his journal, we may kill all the men in the colonies, but then we'll have to deal with the women. And, and I just, I think that's a great compliment. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason why I called the Bad Girls of the American Revolution, I was doing a presentation once for a, uh, a group of women down in Waco <clears throat> at the Episcopal Church of, of the Holy Spirit. And um, for any of you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, who are Episcopalians, uh, there's a group within the church known as the ECW, the Episcopal Church Women, and they were having their meeting that day. And they, and I can't, you know, I can't even remember what they asked me to come and speak on. But I was sitting through their business meeting, listening to everything that was going on in the church and everything that's going on that side of Waco. And they were talking about a play they were going to put on for the church entitled Bad Girls of the Bible. And it's, it's a, uh, it, there's a book by that title, and it's Women of Faith in the Old Testament and the New Testament. As a matter of fact, the book was so widely popular, the author went and made a Bad Girls of the Bible part two and talked about other women that he hadn't covered in the first book. And I started thinking to myself, you know, I could probably put together a, a, a Bad Girls of the Amer American Revolution, talk about women's contributions. So I went up to my, my contact lady at the end of the meeting and told her that. And I said, go pencil me in for a year from now and I'll come back and I'll speak on this. Well, about three or four months later, I was back at home. I got contacted by a vice regent of the DAR group. And they said, tell me about some of the programs you've got. And so I started going to, okay, I've got one. My, my, the very first one I ever did was Con the Common Soldier of the American Revolution. And, uh, and I, I've got this one and that one and so on and so on. Oh, and I'm putting together one on women's contributions during the American Revolution. And it's entitled Bad Girls of the American Revolution. That's the one we want. <laughs> so, okay, I can probably put it, put it together in time to come to the meeting. And uh, the very next time I got contacted by a different DAR group, I went through the whole bit weekend and said, oh, and I've also presented one entitled Bad Girls of the American Revolution, but that's the one we want. And so when I finally went back to the, the, the ECW group a year later in Waco, I said, ladies, I'm sorry. I've already given this about seven or eight times, this, this particular talk. So y'all are getting a more polished version of it than I probably would have delivered if it was the first time that I spoke on it. But so let me go ahead and, and start in. I'm gonna start with some of the very, very well-known women and go down to the not so well-known. <clears throat> uh, Abigail Adams, the wife of John Adams. Um, when he went off to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, she stayed on the farm in Braintree, Massachusetts and, and, and looked, looked, uh, looked after the affairs of the farm uh, looked after her children. Um, as a matter of fact, gentlemen, as a little aside, when at that one term that Adams was president of the United States from 1796 to 1800, George Washington, Washington wasn't built. Washington, D.C. was not in existence at this point in time. Uh, they, the president sat in New York City. And so I, and then I, I wonder, is there a so where's the building in New York City? And yes, there is a building referred to as the Federal Building in New York City that was the very first capital. And when Washington was there for his two terms, uh, Martha was with him, beautiful wife. She went with the president and she, she stayed there and entertained and did all, all the other things that first ladies did. When John Adams went there, Abigail Adams hated New York City. So she headed back to the farm in Braintree and for almost the entire four years, he was there in New York City. And now of course they started building the White House under him but while he was president. She still stayed on the farm in Braintree, Massachusetts, would occasionally come to visit but then go right back home. So um, the uh, uh, Abigail Adams, uh, uh, just a tremendous woman, she and her children were within the were within sound of the guns at Bunker Hill. They actually stood down at the end of the, uh, the walkway that led, where it led out into the lane, and they handed out ladles of water to American troops as they were retreating uh, from Bunker Hill. 
many people don't know that America was going through a smallpox epidemic during the entirety of the American Revolution. It was just, it, it was really doing a tear up job on Indian tribes out on the frontier because they would come into contact with a, a white merchant and Indian trader. They would contract it from him and it would just, uh, the Shawnee with this, this tremendously, this tribe has got a tremendous history of holding back our advances in the Ohio country. Uh, most of the time when Daniel Boone's fighting against Native Americans and Shawnee warriors that are, that are raiding down into Kentucky, they had lost 90% of their tribal strength by the time they were having to deal with the Americans and they still held us up for several years pushing uh, further and further westward. So think what they could have done if they had been an original strength. Um, <clears throat> She had her children, uh, she and her children inoculated against, uh, against smallpox. And uh, what a, a physician who felt comfortable doing it, what he would do is he would have uh, basically an individual who had the full blown form of, the, uh, of uh, the disease. And he would be traveling in a cart with the doctor. He would be in the back, he made as comfortable as possible. Uh, they would take a sewing needle with uh, a bit of thread uh, on the end of it. They would pass it through a live active pustule on that individual's body. They would then prick up a little bit of skin either on the forearm or on the lower leg, and they would pass the needle through that little bit of skin, hoping to give a light form of the disease to the individual so that their body could fight back against it. People were known to die from being inoculated because the needle might have gone to a little too deep. And, uh, but uh, she was inoculated along with uh, her children. One of the daughters got very, very sick, but finally did recover from it. She's the one who wrote, uh, wrote the famous words, uh, Remember the Ladies. And uh, uh, this is when she knew that Adams and her husband and the rest of Congress were putting together uh, the Articles of Confederation, the means by which we were going to govern the country during the revolution. And uh, she said, don't, don't place us in a position of subservience uh, to men. We too have a role to play in this country. Uh, and and uh, uh, we too have got a very important role, not only to play as, as, as taking care of, of children and raising families and whatnot, but also we've got, we've got, uh, we're, we're your, your, uh, your better half. <laughs> and so, um, and Adams wrote back to her and said, aha, I see the tribe much more numerous and much more dangerous than the British has risen against us. And we better pay attention to that tribe or we'll be overwhelmed by them. And uh, now, uh, Abigail and John Adams carried on probably just as active a, a, a correspondence. Uh, I mean, very, very active correspondence. There's books the, the volumes of their correspondence out there. Martha and George Washington probably carried on just as active correspondence. Um, now, Martha Washington's contribution to the revolutionary cause, I think it's very creative. She stayed on the plantation there at Mount Vernon and directed it. But when in the, in the 18th century, when winter set in, armies would do what was called go into winter quarters. They would basically, they would establish a large camp and they would stay there for the entire winter. Now they did it just outside of, just a little bit over a day's march away from the enemy. They didn't want the enemy to settle down up in New York City and the Continental Army was down in, in Charleston, South Carolina. They, they wouldn't know what was going on. They wanted to be able to keep an eye on each other during, uh, during the winter. And, uh, but if the other side decided we're going to, uh, to prepare for a sneak attack, and we're gonna gather our guys together and do a force march, the pickets and the outliers of the other army would pick them up coming in and they could warn their camp to, uh, to get ready for, uh, uh, for, for, the, uh, for this attack. So probably the most famous winner, you know, in, in American 
American history, winter 1777 to 78 at, at Valley Forge. Um, the British are firmly ensconced in Philadelphia. They've just captured the city. The officers are preparing for a season of balls and, and uh, plays, theater, all that kind of stuff. And of course, the American army is just outside uh, the city uh, in, in Red Valley Forge in what Sir Otto Trevelyan, a uh, British historian, has termed the most famous encampment in the history of the world. And uh, now, each winter, when Martha knew, when she received word that, that, that George and the army had gone into winter quarters, she would turn over uh, oversight of uh, Mount Vernon to overseers. And she would travel to wherever Washington was, and she would spend the winter with him there. And, uh, uh, at, 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 and she did it for each winter of the war. And so, yes, she was at Valley Forge. Uh, that, that I think that I believe that the I, I, I was on the battlefield, gentlemen, literally over, over 50 years ago. I was 11 years old. And, and I just, so I don't remember a whole lot of it, but I know that the house, the little two story house of Washington's headquarters, is still there. And she, she stayed there. She organized other officers' wives. Um, into basically kind of a sewing circle and they would produce bandages and poultices and things like that for uh, for the, the hospital that was in Yellow Spring, uh, not too far away. And they would knit uh, uh, caps and, and mitts and, and scarves and things like that for the soldiers themselves. The interesting thing is it was the next winter, the winter of 1778 to 79, it was the most severe winter on record in North America, temperatures got down to 25 degrees below zero and then stayed there for weeks at a time. New York Harbor froze solid. The British who had captured New York at that point realized that they were in danger of their fleet being frozen in and they shifted it out into open sea just simply to avoid that, that uh, what would have been a catastrophe for them. Uh, uh, deer were dying in the forest because they, they couldn't scrape away enough snow to get down to the dry grass and eat it. Men were reduced to stripping bark off the trees and boiling it uh, so that it would get soft enough that they could chew it. Uh, they would actually take their shoes off and remove the buckles and boil their shoes to the point where the leather was very, very soft and they would actually consume uh, their shoes. Christmas dinner that year was a gill of rice which if you can think back to the little milk cartons that we had back in elementary school when they were some shoes, that's about a gill. Uh, so a gill of rice and a spoonful of vinegar. That was Christmas dinner for Christmas of 1778. And, uh, and Martha Washington was with George there at, at Morristown, New Jersey. Morristown, New Jersey overnight became the fourth largest city in, in North America because the entire continental army was concentrated right there. Many years later, uh, when after Washington had died, uh, Martha Washington was approached by members of the government asking if she's willing to have her correspondence with George Washington published. And uh, she read back through it all, again, probably brought back a flood of memories, but she felt like it was correspondence that was just a little too intimate and passed between a loving wife and husband. And so she didn't really, she destroyed all of it. it, it she burned all of it. Uh, I've heard that the Mount Vernon Society or the Mount Vernon Association has, uh, has got provenience on five letters, uh, three from George to Martha, two from Martha to George, and uh, that, they, that they know were letters that passed between the two of them. And I know some of them are in their possession, but I don't think all of them are, but they know where those other letters are. And uh, now that, those are the very, very famous, uh, and there's, there's again, many, many other stories uh, that, that went along with that. One that I will share with you gentlemen and you ladies that, that I normally don't share, Catherine Schuyler, the, the wife of Philip Schuyler. Uh, he was the Northern commander of the Continental Army for a long, long period of time while it was up in Canada and, and then there in New York State. Um, she was on, they, they, 
they call them plantations, but there's a completely different system working up there. It's the old Dutch system uh, of patroons and tenant farmers. And so they have a large estate. I guess that's the best way to term it. And she's still there on the estate. Uh, she, she knows, she receives word via neighbors, via letters with her husband, that General Burgoyne was coming down through Lake Champlain, on down through Lake George, which known as the Great Warrior Road. And then they're going to, to march by the river down to Albany. Uh, General Clinton is supposed to be coming up from New York City. They're planning on cutting off New England from the rest of the colonies and then just dealing with them piecemeal. Uh, she knows that her the wheat, she's got 20,000 acres of wheat under cultivation. It is, it is not only food for them for this next year, it's the way she's going to make money. And she knows Burgoyne's army is probably living off the land. They're going to come through about the time the wheat needs to be harvested, and they're going to have all kinds of, of, of raw materials to make bread for themselves. So she gathered her maid servants together, that the torches that went out and they set fire uh, to the, they burned the entire 20,000 acres. I mean, she wasn't just simply depriving the British of, of, uh, of goods, which is a patriotic thing to do, but she's also destroying her years, labors in, in income and whatnot. But, uh, you know, and it was acts like that that really slowed her going down quite a bit because he had planned on, on harvesting a lot of, of uh, just basically sending out foraging parties and taking the food they needed. But they found kind of scorched earth instead as they, were, as they headed down to, uh, uh, to Saratoga. Um, and and I, don't, I don't talk a whole lot about Catherine Schuyler. And there's, again, there's, there's lots of them that I won't mention to you gentlemen. Uh, tonight. There are three women that I want to be sure to mention, though. Um, the first one is uh, very, very, uh, is probably famous. I'm sure a number of you have heard of her. Her name is Deborah Sampson from Bethel, Massachusetts. Uh, the DAR chapter in Bethel, Massachusetts today is referred to as the Deborah Sampson chapter. And Deborah took her uh, desire to participate or her desire to, to, uh, um, assert her will uh, for the Patriot cause a little bit further. She disguised herself as a man, adopted a man's name and joined the, she's from uh, Bethel, Massachusetts. She joined the Massachusetts militia. Well, she was found out probably about a month or two later. And, uh, and you guys know, you know, all the testosterone we've got, you know, coursing through us, you know, the, all the chest beating that was probably going on still this early in the war. They said, you're a woman, you don't need to be here, go home. And so they drummed her out of camp. And, uh, but Deborah wasn't to be deterred. She went back home. She, uh, she allowed things to quiet down. Then she did the same thing again, except instead of the militia, she joined the Continental Army. She joined the regular US Army. Uh, she actually joined the 5th Massachusetts Regiment of Foot, changed her name to Robert Shercliffe, and joined this uh, a regiment and fought with it for the next five years. Uh, no one ever figured out that Deborah wasn't, that, that Robert wasn't Robert. <laughs> they just assumed that this is, that's his name, and so this is another guy. Um, they slept 10 men to a tent. And, uh, and uh, I, I've got, it's been a long time since I've set it up, but I've got a tent at home, these bell tents that were used during the revolution. And the tent runs this way, but the guys slept. They, they, and they, they slept so that one guy had his head at this end, the other one had it at that end, this end, that end, and whatnot. You had enough space to lie down in, but only about a foot to a foot and a half uh, of, of, uh, of room on either side of you. So whenever anybody wanted to roll over, he had to wake up everybody else and they all had to roll <laughs> at the same time. Now, it, it's great for it. It's, it's great for body warmth, for the exchange of body warmth. You stay warm with, with people. Like, but none of those other nine guys ever figured out that Robert wasn't Robert. At one point, she was actually wounded in a battle. She shot in the leg. 
And her tent mate said, we need to take you to the surgeon. She said, no, 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 it's okay. It's just a, it's a flesh wound, I'll be fine. So she was back in her, in her tent by herself at one point. She took a knife out. She dug the bullet out of her own leg, bandaged herself, and then continued on uh, with her uh, regular activities. Um, so that it, it, would, it would look like it was just a light flesh wound. Now, when the war ended, we did not immediately begin to demobilize the Continental Army because it took a while, it took about a year and a half of negotiations for the final, the definitive treaty of Paris to be written. And so Washington realized they got to keep the Continental Army together because we have to keep an eye on the British. If we just simply all dissolve, the British will just come in and take everything over and they'll stop negotiations and whatnot. So between the end of the Yorktown, which is the last major battle of the war, and uh, and uh, the, the signing of the definitive treaty, in that period in there, uh, Deborah Sampson became ill and she became delirious with the fever and her tent mates did take her to the surgeon. And the surgeon found out, uh, figured out Robert wasn't a Robert. And so, uh, he, but he waited for her to regain consciousness. He said, I know what you are, I don't know who you are. You said your name's Robert, but you're not a Robert. And she said, my name is Deborah Sampson, and please don't allow me to reveal my secret in, in my time. Well, eventually, when the treaty was signed, the army does begin to be demobilized. The 5th Massachusetts is being demobilized. Uh, Deborah Sampson comes to the surgeon and says, I'm ready. I'm ready to reveal my secret. Oh, and I'm sorry, gentlemen. Uh, the surgeon wrote an affidavit when, when Deborah said, please don't tell my, my secret yet. And he just simply said, on such and such day, Private Robert Shirtliff was brought into my tent and there is fever. I figured out Robert's not a Robert. Robert says his name is actually Deborah. And, uh, and he kept that affidavit. And uh, so uh, when, when Deborah goes to him and says she's ready to tell, uh, uh, the commanding officer of the 5th Massachusetts is signing discharge papers in his tent. And in walks a, 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 a by all accounts, she I've heard she was, she was actually quite beautiful. Walked in, you know, a beautiful woman walks in in the gown. He rises to meet her. He bows. He says, Who do I have the pleasure of meeting? And Deborah says, Robert Shirtliff. And the, the commanding officer says, No, no, no. Robert Shirtliff has fought under my command for the last five years. You must be his sister. And she said, No, I am Robert Shirtliff. And that's when the surgeon came in and gave the affidavit. The gentlemen, especially you gentlemen who are veterans, know the commanding officers don't like to be fooled by enlisted men, and, and particularly for five years running. Um, the, uh, the other one who is who I, I deliberately put with Deborah Sampson is uh, Molly uh, Ludwig Hayes, with the better known as Molly Pitcher. And uh, her husband, she did not disguise herself. It was known that she was a camp follower. Now, camp followers, that just that term has gotten a really bad rap from the American Civil War. It's got the connotation of prostitutes. But uh, yes, there were some during the American Revolution that did that, but many of them just simply were accompanying their husbands. They had their kids with them. Uh, because the man would draw full rations the wife would draw half rations and each of the kids would draw quarter rations. And so the family could kind of pool its food and feed everybody because we all know 15 year olds aren't going to want to get by. 15 year old boy is not going to want to get by on a quarter of what half of what mom's got and a quarter of what dad's got. So, but um, they were laundresses, they were nurses, they were cooks, uh, they sewed. Uh, they repaired uniforms, they did all kinds, of, they, they did what was necessary to keep the, the soldiers free to do their duties. Now, when a battle would start, a lot of times these camp followers would follow the army onto the battlefield. When they figured out where the American army was going to be set up, they would find a source of water back behind them, and they would fill up canteens, <laughs> They would fill up buckets, they would fill up pitchers, which is where her last name or her moniker comes from, and they would ferry it to the troops during the battle just to keep them hydrated. 
The first battle Washington in marching out of Valley Forge, the first battle he marched into was the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse. Uh, New Jersey was hit by a record heat wave that holds 105 degrees in the direct sun. Some regiments were losing more men to heat stroke than were actually being killed by enemy gunfire. And uh, Molly Pitcher's husband was a member of the cannon crew. And at one point, uh, he was either wounded or he just passed out. And Molly stepped up and took over his position, which was uh, was loading the cannonballs down the cannon. She was seven months pregnant at this point in time, was loading those cannonballs. Washington observed her and actually sent a letter of commendation to her uh, afterwards. Now, the third woman, uh, basic again, another, another camp follower, her name was uh, Molly Corbin. Uh, the DAR chapter in Colleyville is called the Captain Molly Corbin chapter. And um, so I got to go and, and deliver this to them one time on their namesake. And uh, sh uh, her husband too was part of an artillery crew. Early in the war, they were a part of the defense of Fort Washington. That was on one side of the Hudson River and Fort Lee was directly across the river on the other side. And Washington had the very unpleasant duty of being in Fort Lee and watching the assault on the fort that was named after him. And of course, the Hessians actually captured the fort. And um, it, it, at some points, most of that, uh, most of the American gun crews had fled because the Hessians were just coming right up the hillside. Uh, but Molly continued to stay and, 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 man, and man the cannon that her husband was at. She was eventually wounded in the, uh, in, in, I think it's the left shoulder, very severely wounded. Uh, and uh, uh, for any of you who all who know who, uh, the artist I'm talking about, Don Triani, he's got some beautiful, beautiful paintings of actions during the American Revolution. And one of them is the Hessians coming over the earthwork walls at, uh, in Fort Washington. Uh, and everybody is either dead or has already run, except Molly, who's slumped against the cannon, you know, with it bleeding from her, uh, from her right shoulder. She's about to be bayoneted by a couple of Hessian grenadiers, and their officers are knocking the muskets away because they said it's a woman. You know, it's, it's not a man, it's a woman. She was captured. She was eventually uh, exchanged back to the Patriots. She never really regained use of her left arm, but she did continue to wear the uniform that she learned to wear in the army, which is just like this one. And she continued to smoke the pipe that she learned to smoke in the army too. Now, I mentioned those three women because when Congress passed the Pension Act in 1818 to provide funding for the veterans of the American <clears throat> Revolution, to give them something, many of them had fallen on very, very hard times. They were petitioning the government to give them support. Uh, Usually all, all those men had to do was, uh, at the very least, was to name an officer that they had served under who was still alive. And then Congress would contact that officer and say, do you remember this guy? And, and if the officer said, yeah, sure, I do, they would give the, the pension to him. If the officer couldn't remember, then usually he, they would have to have leading members of that individual's a town come forward and say, this person enlisted and was gone for this period of time and whatnot. And then Congress would decide whether or not they wanted to give uh, that pension. Those three women, uh, Deborah Sampson, uh, Mary Ludwig Hayes, and Molly Corbin filed for pensions as combat soldiers, and they all three received it. Mm -hmm. They're the only three women that I know of that actually received a pension from the US government for services during the American, uh, the American Revolution. The last one I'm going to talk about, and then I'll then I'll open it up for questions, uh, is uh, uh, down south. <laughs> uh, Nancy Hart, a, uh, a back woman in our uh, backwoods woman. So she's out on the frontier. She's in Georgia. Uh, her husband is the leader of the local Patriot militia. Uh, and um, he's away with his militia group monitoring uh, British military movements. She's alone at home with her three small children, uh, all of which were under the age of five. And um, she's just kind of doing chores there in the house. 
and the door bursts open and in walk five loyalist soldiers, Americans that are fighting for, uh, for the British. And uh, one of them comes, one of the soldiers comes in and slaps the carcass of a gander down the table and says, you're going to prepare, you are going to cook this for us. She recognizes the gander as having come from her own farmyard. So not only are these guys breaking and entering, they're stealing from me. Nancy realized these guys were all very, very drunk. And so she pulls the bottle, the jug of rum out from underneath the bed, hopes to keep the lubrication going to the point where she can, can grab a gun and, and deal with these guys. She finally sees that, that opportunity. She grabs a musket. She shoots the first guy and kills him. Drops that musket, picks a second one up. And then just like the muskets, just like these guys, they weigh about 10 and a half pounds a piece. That, and they're single shot. So uh, she shoots the second, wounds the second guy, picks up a third musket and holds these guys at, at, at bay. And um, now, you know, it, it would have been a, a frontier cabin, so it was small. A trained British soldier takes about 20 seconds to reload one of these guns, and an awful lot can happen in a small, confined space in about 20 seconds. But the deal was, none of these guys moved to try to overpower her because Nancy Hart was cross-eyed. And all these guys said, no, she's looking at me. She's going to shoot me. And I don't feel like I'm shot. So they stood there, you know, holding their arms up until, until her, uh, her husband and the Patriot Militia came back and arrested these guys and took them off to wherever they incarcerated British, uh, British troops. Uh, I have heard, I, 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 and I, I, I've tried to Google it online. She, her, it, it's Hart County, Georgia. You know, it's named after her, and the courthouse. It's the it's the uh, the the, the, uh, the county courthouse has actually got the statues around them, like all the courthouses here in Texas. But one of them is a full size statue of Nancy Hart. And uh, a daughter asked me one time you know, when I when I talked about Nancy Hart, she raised her hand and said, "Yes, ma'am. What was your question?" She said. Is the statue cross-eyed? <laughs> and once again, ladies and gentlemen, there are tons of other stories. And the reason why I call them bad girls, because there were lots of them that were spies. British women would have never thought about doing this. They, it would have been disreputable for them to have changed their name to a man's name and served as a combat soldier, to, to have worked as a spy, uh, and so that's that's part of the reason why I left the name Bad Girls of the American Revolution. Uh, do you, gentlemen or ladies, have any questions at all that you might want to ask? Thank you so much for allowing me to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again so much for coming and speaking uh, for this evening. We've got two cameras on Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. We saw the children of the American Revolution. The chapter there belonged to was a group that flew away from Woodward. To see whether or not there was a right up in the country. I've got another presentation of how to find such patriots at the American Republic of Children's Revolution. Okay, so we're going to have you back. Mark, come on. Check me. Thank you so much. And by the way, uh, yes, some wonderful uh, exhibits over here. Maybe after the meeting, you yes. can stay, right? Yeah, I, I will you stay. You can go anyway, some things he brought expected here. And you got to, okay, so we just got to do this. You got you to talk about that. Oh, the, the helmet? Yes. <laughs> you know, it's, it, so 
No, well, go ahead. Don't, don't shoot me, but it's, uh, no, it reminds I, me of something I, I, I remember I, I, from the I, I, Wizard of Oz. So you need to, you need to talk to me oh, about that. I never thought about that. Yeah, so anyway, it does it's, look, uh, it looks yeah. like that. The, the I don't know where I'm wrong on that. Um, the, this is a Dragoon helmet. Uh, it's uh, made by an individual who lives in, in um, he's a Napoleonic reenactor, and he lives in, in Ohio. And, uh, uh, and uh, it's got the rosette. The black rosette is uh, here on this side is for uh, the Americans. The white rosette uh, is a nod towards the French. So this is what's known as the Alliance cockade. Uh, the, the, I, I questioned him, I said, would they have had red feathers? He said, oh, feathers were big business back in the colonies during that time. Um, this, uh, but the, the, fast, the reason why I have this is my patriot ancestors all fought in the South Carolina militia. And the South Carolina militia made these helmets for themselves. I've actually got a contemporary description of one of these helmets. And, and it's the same thing. It's got the big, the big uh, plume of bear skin across the, the top. There is a metal band that runs from ear to ear and then runs from the back of the head to the front of the head. Uh, with this bear skin, which got thick, thick hide uh, laid across the top. Um, this was obviously created by individuals who knew they were going to be fighting other cavalry, other like Charlton's British Legion and, uh, and the 16th Black Dragoons, the 17th Black Dragoons. Uh, and so they made these helmets so that their heads would be protected from saber strokes. And, uh, uh, and so I, I was fascinated by that when I found out that this is probably the, the, the headgear of my patriot ancestors. So, oh, and also the, uh, the horse here hanging down the back. Again, it's meant to, to at least somewhat impede a sword stroke that might come from behind. So, no. yes. You actually wear that? Yes. Get some of picture. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it, it, it fits it fits very, very well. <laughs> so, but, um, but yeah, this is what most of the, the South Carolina back militia, and I'm putting together a presentation on, on them because when Charleston fell in May of 1780, it was the largest capture of Congress during the course of the American Revolution. 5,500 of them went into uh, British captivity. Basically, they eliminated the southern line, uh, the line of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. They were all captured and it only left the militia. And um, that's, when the, that's when the war got really, really brutal. <laughs> it was because the militia realized we're all, we're, we are all that stands between the British Army and our home state being completely overrun. And so you had uh, Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, uh, Thomas Sumter, the Gamecock, that's what he was called, and then uh, Nathaniel Green, who they just called him the Quaker because he, well, he was a Quaker. Um, but those guys rose up, and, uh, and a lot of parallels have been, have been drawn between South Carolina militia and the Viet Cong because that's exactly the way they were fighting. They would, they would come in, they would strike quickly and get away. The British even began to write in their own journals that you didn't pursue them. If they got away from you, you didn't pursue them if you wanted to live. Because if you chased them into the woods, you were just as likely to not come back out. So. Very good, thank you. That's good, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, moving along here, um, <clears throat> our veterans project. Um, I thank you, thank you, thank you. We've got a box full here, and I'm gonna tell you, no, I probably, I, I, I put it to you this way, I've got over 130 books. Okay, so with the ones at home, plus these here, plus you've got some more, I know, and there's some other people that have told me gotta get together. Here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I didn't know. Oh, that's not you know what? Yeah, that's not anyway, I just don't believe it. I think the 
Yeah, that's almost way over there, right? Okay, so anyway, so uh, it, it, as you recall, we were, uh, like I said, we, we last time we talked about how we were going to do this project. And I never know how these are going to turn out, but you know what? I got to tell you, this is like the one when we did, we decided we we're going to do wreaths across America that they'll put them on the graves. There's no problem at all. Like, you know, people step up. So I'm so proud of you guys. You know, this is great. There's a lot of people up there. Uh, the gentleman back there can tell you back because he, he still gets in every once in a while, I think, that, that are really suffering. You know, and this is going to hopefully bring a little bit of a smile to the face, but it's going to bring a little more after. So, Tom, thank you so much. We have a community living center. And this community living center is uh, just the veterans. Now, they also have a substance abuse area, which is 170 bed mm. drug rehab. And, and, uh, uh, we as ASAR are the only people that are not employed at the VA that have ever been allowed into the substance abuse area. TL and I and several of our guys who grew up here, we presented the 70 Vietnam commemoration ends to those guys. And if you want to talk about guys that were down here that are working their way back up here and really see somebody that appreciates when you do something for them, they don't acknowledge that they have a drug that you have a bottle. They don't go around and, and, and they brag about having a drug that you have. That used to be a hospital. And they take one whole wing of nothing but for the, for the uh, substance abuse. And what they do is once a week, they have a graduation of the 12 step program. And they make all of the guys that are in that program into an art program they have there. And they acknowledge the guys that are graduating from that 12 step program. It's one of the most emotional things that I've ever done in the VA. Being allowed to go in there to present these Vietnam commemoration pins. If anybody in here qualifies for the commemoration pin and you not received it, if you served in this <coughs> military and active duty service, May, uh, November 15, 1955, to May 15, 1975. No matter where you serve, no matter, no matter what branch you are in, you are eligible for the Vietnam Commemoration Pen. Yeah. I've got two in my pocket here if you're qualified to have a one. Okay. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, again, thank you so much. Okay. I'll get these. Uh, up to them once we got some more to pick up, we'll, we'll get them up there. Like I said, I think we've probably got more books than we've got people up there. That's a good thing, right? So we'll just see how it works out. Okay, so uh, uh, next up, Bob, you want to talk about the just say a few words about our next one or two? Sure. Uh, the, the closest event coming up is going to be Saturday the 18th, which is in two days. And that'll be the Audie Murphy Parade in Farmerville, Texas. We're mustering at 9 a.m. at the corner of Washington and Farmerville Parkway. And uh, Gary, Gary's actually going to be there, and he'll be in charge. You want to elaborate on that? Uh, obviously, it's already pretty well. Uh, there are uh, for any of the colored artists that want to participate, there will be plenty of ways to ride uh Tom Whitelock at Dallas chapter three is because of his flag truck. And uh, so some will be on that. Also we have the uh, trailer from the four, the Ben Sand chapter will be there for you guys to come. So they can walk for throughout about nine minutes or mile. Uh, we should have a heat a cold front coming through, so it's only supposed to be about 95. So, <laughs> oh, right. Right. Yeah. so we should have great weather. Like wear the heavy uniform, right? Wear the wool. So uh, that's the 
And then the other one, uh, I guess after that would be the uh, Fourth of July. Yeah, the Fourth of July, which is in Red Rock Road. Right. Right. Yep. Oh, like, you might call it Red Rock Road. That's what I was saying. So, anyway, I'm going to say red, white, and blue, blue parade. So it's actually on the Fourth of July. So, it's here. So, uh, anyway. Why don't anybody around here, you know, it's not that long a parade. There's usually, well, last year there were a lot of people here. Okay. Come and, you know, let us know you're there when we, uh, when we walk by. You know, we'd love to see you there. So, anyway, we had a good time last year, and I don't know the reason why we won't have another good time this year. Hey, Gary, you never know. We may pick up some more money. So, that's not a bad thing, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll just have to see if they let us have it two years in a row. I don't know. And I think most of you know last year basically we entered this thing, decorated the trailer, you know, not expecting anything. In fact, I'm not even sure I knew there was a prize to the group. And we ended up walking walk, walking away with five hundred dollars. So it was a pretty good deal. My suspicion they won't reward it to us again, but you never know. Let's see what happens. Um, what time are we going to bust it on that? I think it's nine o'clock. Well, don't hold me to that. I believe it. I think it's not. I haven't seen. I think it's yet. not. He hasn't sent any. He sent it out. I think you know. Be sure to register. I'll call him up tomorrow and chat with him. But I'm pretty sure it's nine o'clock and the parade starts at ten. So uh, and we probably will muster in that same area there. It's over there, close to the public library in that area over there. So uh, anyway, and like I said, I don't. I, I don't hear any even, even a guess as to how many people were there because they were lined up. All around both sides, it's all pretty small. Yeah, the crowd, yeah, the crowd. I mean, yeah, it was, it was a lot of people there, and all of them were happy to see this, you know, that sort of good thing. <laughs> okay, anyway, okay, thanks, Bob. And uh, let's see here, okay, uh, just a quick one on the October BOM. I'm uh, continuing to work through that, I spent quite a bit today working on it, planning for that. BOM that we're the sponsors are in October. Uh, if you look on the back cover here, it tells you sort of where we are on things. Uh, oh, just right quick, we've got the hotel, we've got the banquet speaker who's here tonight. He's not even going to look at that. I, I told him I wouldn't think on him tonight, but anyway, he's here tonight. I'm excited he can come back here. Uh, we pay our first two deposits on the, relative to the hotel. Uh, I've had initial discussions with the hotel event planner, um, trying to understand the, the food and, and the cost of the food. Have you ever had that problem, Greg? No. How much no. of the food cost? No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, or it's sort of, I, I can't, I can't get that, you know. You're going to pay more than we did, I hear. Oh, you know. it's a lot more, but we won't talk about there. You know, so I, I think I'm, I don't know. Can I say? You won't make any money off the food. I don't think we're yeah, right. But anyway, but uh, but I think uh, anyway. So we're moving along there. Uh, I still need uh, ideals uh, ideals for a raffle item. Each year we we have a, a raffle off something. Okay, uh, the last one that I went to was the, uh, the state convention. I guess where uh, where is that guy that won that raffle? Uh, that musket. Yep. The winner is back here. He won one musket, so that was good. So, so but have you gotten the whole drill so you can fire it yet? Okay, so good. All right. So he has fired. Huh? He has fired. I haven't. Okay. Well, good. So that's good. So anyway, so anyway, we're looking for some more ideas. I have a backup option. You know, I have to use it. I'll use it. But uh, but uh, somebody's got some good ideas for something where we might can make a little money. And that money goes for the youth and for programs. Is that correct, guys? The so, raffle so silent auction money goes for Patriots fund. the Patriots fund. The raffle goes in your pocket. Oh, more motivation. Okay, I'm more motivated now. Okay, so guys, we got to find something we can raffle off for a lot of money. This is good. Okay, okay, we are doing the silent auction thing. I, we got a few more. Uh, contributions today. Thank you, Matt. Ned, for those. So we'll get those on the list. I've got a list going of those. So if you have something that you would 
I'd like to uh, basically uh, go toward the Patriots Fund, uh, and that's the state fund, right? The state Patriots Fund. Um, we have an old uniform that, you know, sort of won't quite button anymore or something like that. Whatever you might have. <laughs> what? Patriot Fund goes in for responding to use on this? Yes. Yeah, that's, I had it backwards. Yeah, it's the, the, earn, the earnings from that goes for, the, we don't touch the principal for that. We, the, we live off the earnings for that, and that's what we give our uh, youth award winner. And we've done very well the last couple of years, which is why we love the amounts for right. our several awards. Right. So those are really worthy thoughts, guys. So think about it. If you've got something or feel the urge to buy something and give it to us, whatever you think, please. Just think about that. Okay, um, <clears throat> I haven't really gotten real real active on the volunteers yet. I know I've got some people that are going to help me. I'm going to need more, but I'm still just trying to get everything all scoped out in my mind first and, and on paper. So anyway, uh, if you, we'll we'll talk some more about what we need to do when we get a little closer to that then. Um, <clears throat> let's see. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next meeting is on July the 21st, right here. Uh, the manager here promises me that the boxes are out for good. I'm not sure I believe that, but the boxes <laughs> on what we used to have here with all the cups and the take home items, everything's gone. Now it's a lot nicer looking now. So excited about that. And I told him that when I went through the line. So, anyway, and uh, let's see here. What else? Okay, for the. Uh, our new business, um, the, the main minutes are published on the website. Um, do I hear a motion uh, to uh, approve those minutes as written? So moved. Is that Pete? Yeah. Pete, okay. Second. Second. Do we have any discussion? Hearing, All, hearing none. Thank you, Sergeant at Arms. Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Okay, up to the treasurer report. There we go. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to read for May. And our starting balance was $5,148.13. It was $169.95 paid out. Deposits were $1,429. So it puts us a nice healthy balance of six thousand four hundred seven and eighteen dollars. Thank you. You'll hear a motion to accept the uh, treasurer's report as written and spoken. Accepted. Okay. Um, second. Well, one of them. Okay. Between the two, it's Bob and me. So okay. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Oh, and I didn't say here in that. Okay. That's good. Okay, so uh, other announcements, business things from the floor. I've got several people I want to uh, talk, and the first one is headed my way. I love to thank the color guard and from um, the um, May parade, we had four muskets that we needed to fire downtown Denison. And your chapter president was one of those individuals who got a chance to fire a musket. And I have a presentation for you. Step this way. <laughs> this is a certification our certificate of commendation to Tom Wilson for successfully firing of the musket. <laughs> and he didn't shoot himself. In the I, did, I did not. <laughs> I, I was worried about that. But let's see. And Gary, and Gary mentioned. When he came back, he said, did it fire? And I said, yes. And he didn't, he didn't trust me, I don't think, because he touched the barrel and said, yeah, it was hot. <laughs> I saw that casket, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, what, the follow-ups? Um, 
Uh, I don't know what it was, but I was never I was worried. worried. Maybe somebody knew I was fixing the shit. Yeah. Did Tom yeah. load it himself? Mention how rare it is to get fire in public like this. Oh. This is the second time that I've ever been able to fire in public. And I've been doing this for five years at least. So this was just unusual. But it was really a lot of fun. And I wish we had had more people to put a lot more smoke in the air. But it was really funny because a lot of things you could hear from the audience. That's a lot of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and that was loud. Yeah, it was. But we had a lot of fun. And in fact, somebody, we were walking back to uh, the car, several of us were there where we parked it. Actually, somebody came to me and said, that was the highlight of the parade. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh, one one more. Okay. I have to tell you, we were in the parking lot at Dollar Tree, and these four guys never fired their muscle. <laughs> That's true. Tom was one of them. And I gave a lesson right there in the parking lot to the four guys, and they did very well. So I, I they all went on. And uh, well, TL fired. I'm not giving him a certificate because he's probably got <laughs> so many certificates and just end up in a stack somewhere. Sorry, TL. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Did, did, Tom, it. did Tom load it? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Tom loaded. He loaded and everything. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. 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 I wonder whether it's going to go off or not, but it sure did. Okay. A lot of fun, guys. You all ought to get into this. It really is a lot of fun. I mean, it's like being a kid again. Right, everyone that does it. It's like being a kid again, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Um, Great. Do you have any comments tonight? Or uh, just yeah, a couple comments. Uh, one, uh, my primary reason for being here tonight, most people can always hear me without a microphone. Uh, my primary reason for being here tonight was to bring you 10 Texas Society Wounded Warrior points. And if you remember back at the January meeting when I was here, uh, we talked about how National was not able to provide those anymore. Um, still working on it, and as it's today, they're still working on it and don't have any national challenge points. So uh, we went out, we found some Texas Society, we bought 300 back in March. We so far got rid of about 100 of them, and there's 10 that I brought here to him. Um, and actually, when I went to leadership at National, we gave the design to five or six other states who are going to do it themselves too. Really? Yeah. So um, I want to thank the Kenny chapter for pushing me to do that and uh, give y'all some of the credit. Uh, but it's with all the good work that y'all do for your veterans. Now you've got one more tool. Back to something. And they let us back in there. Yep. Because I've heard your stories about doing it. So. Okay, thank you. And then we're going to do some more in that area. We'll talk about that maybe the next time or the next couple of times. But... We've actually, uh, we have a, someone else here. We have to look, look at it next time. Who's uh, purchased quite a few that should be uh, coming our way here pretty soon. So anyway, I'm passing the coin around. I would like to get that back, guys. <laughs> <laughs> at least you can see what it looks like. Yes, sir. Are you going to sell on the other chair? It's me? Yeah. I don't know. I was thinking about giving them away. Why? Well, I was going to buy one so I can take it where are you going? National. I'll, I'll, I'll sell you one. Since you gave me a certificate, it's going to cost you, though, you know. Well, we just raised. <laughs> <laughs> it's it was, it was the price of commission to see the look on President General Wright's face yeah. when I handed him one and told him what it was. <laughs> and I asked the Oklahoma Society to oh. Oh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> He was speechless. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, Trish. Well, that's good. Anyway, so when that coin gets circling back around, it's yours. And it's a gift to me. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, let's see here. What else? We have? Do we have any other uh, business from the floor? Let's see. Uh, Greg, uh, let's see here. Gary? 
district vice president. Do you have any other? Yes, let me uh, mention my name last time. Yeah, this, this, some of this. Um, this is a project that's in works, and we're not ready to like hit the dates yet. But we are coming along very well with the marking of a Patriot grade in Bonham, Texas. Hopefully by this fall. This is a very unusual opportunity we have in Texas to to do this. So we uh, we have identified. Uh, we've been working on the TLs. We're working on the headstone to get it restored, and we hope that we will be having this uh, come at work. Our target is sometime in September. I'm um, uh, working with. Uh, I'm in contact with Jill Cock and all about uh, getting a date set uh, for sure. Uh, but if anyone would like to participate with this, there's going to be a multitude of jobs to do. We have got to clean up the cemetery. It's a family cemetery. There's lots of uh, broken off limbs and leaves. All we like to put them up. And uh, I said we were repairing the headstone. And, uh, so keep that uh, in mind coming up this fall. And if you want to participate, we'll get you plugged in somewhere. We'll, we'll make you the chairman of the committee. We'll make a committee for you. We'll make a committee. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make one up. Well, we thought about that. We were wondering about it. it too crazy. Yeah, we got to let people out. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. No, logistics. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's not good. It's not close. Okay. So, but we yeah. thought about that. Though. But again, anyway, this this is. I think Fort Hope is going to be a big deal. Okay. Uh, so. Think about it. It's, we don't get to do this every day here in Texas. Okay, so uh, anyway, I sat in on a meeting last night. I'm going to be part of the work crew. We're going to be able to clean up. Ray's done most of the research. Ray's done a great job on it. It's a very, it's a very interesting story. You're going to be interested in hearing what this guy did and then what he continued to do and that sort of thing. And there he is, right there in the middle of the neighborhood. That's a neighborhood. That's pretty nice looking houses, right? Right off the golf course. Right off the golf course. Right he's, right he's got a view of the golf course, doesn't he? So it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Anyway. So this guy's got a golf course in his backyard and a cemetery in his backyard. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. That guy, the guy that you've been talking to, right? <laughs> yeah. The guy that I, Well, he doesn't admit he owns it. But anyway. Uh, yeah, another nice present. You got any comments? No, we're just on six. We're just glad to be here. Well, good. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Great. Okay, let's see. Who am I? Who am I? Oh, let's see. Anybody else? Any other chapters? Uh, comments? Ben, president of the Vet chapters. And Mark. I was like holding you to last. No, I, I, uh, I've got the uh, the youth awards to stay, and it's you know, obviously we're in summer now, so the kids are out. But start thinking about this fall. Start to identify opportunities for oration, essay, poster, brochure, Eagle Scout, you know, general. And we have a variety of, of great opportunities for, for these guys. And you got the King chapters done very well with the and with the and American history theater. Yeah, so. Uh, that's what I'm going to look for. Guys. Start, start making about your opportunities, start making contracts with the schools, uh, private schools, home school associations, and everything like that. Something should come to the administrators. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts. Yeah. 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 I can never get my neck involved. I'm still going to get it. So, so, I'm on a committee right now. <laughs> he, he was an Eagle Scout. That's my nephew. He was an Eagle Scout, and we went to one of the. That was one of the Plano chapter meetings, and they, had, yep, they, they had their uh, basically their Eagle Scout winner there, and uh, he got into it real big. I knew he was Eagle Scout, but they, they were just conversing about the project and what they did. He started telling me about his book he put together and everything. So, so I think we're about a month out of even being a member here. So, so we're gonna see if we can't work that into it. Okay, is there anything? Oh, yes, sir. The program in September of the Edmund Terrell chapter 
will be Laura Simmons. She is one of only two Lady Texas Rangers in Texas. She's, in she's based in Greenville, Texas. Laura Simmons. She is a homicide investigator. She has two master's degrees. Uh, I had her do a program for me a couple of times. And she was, I was asking her how they found the gun that was used to murder a DA in Hoffman County. Mm -hmm. They got the wife to turn state severance. They, she told them that they threw the gun off of the two mile bridge across Lake Walk. Mm -hmm. They know scuba died five days a week for six weeks and they found the gun in a zipper case. Something that I didn't realize that they were able to do now is they were able to take his DNA off of that gun and they were able to convict him. So it's a, it's a big, the third Wednesday at, uh, in China. Uh, the information will come out, but I guarantee you enjoy it. Enjoy her. She is smart. Okay. Thanks, John. And by the way, John, thanks for what you do for us and our veterans. Okay. Okay. Any other business or that was something else? I think we've got about 10 more minutes. We're doing this. That's my last story or something. Okay. Well, if there's no other business, then uh, I think let's see here. Non bass, could you do our benediction, please? Yes. Let us pray. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, as we close this meeting of the Sons of the American Revolution, we ask that you bless us all with a loving sense of your near presence. Father, guide us, protect us. And help us to know what it is to walk closer to you all the days of our lives. Amen. Okay, now, uh, if you'll join me in the... Uh, Until we meet again, let us remember our obligations to our forefathers who gave us our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and independent Supreme Court, and the nation of free men. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. I'm really excited we got something turned out. And uh, we'll see you again next month.